Interglobal is a help to me as usual. <laughs> Bob, I want to thank you and the department for allowing me the privilege and the honor of introducing Dr. Ginter Global as the Harry Steenbach two-day lecturer. I knew Harry Steenbach and he was on my thesis examining committee just 59 years ago. <laughs> it's nice to have former graduate students and postdoctoral fellows come back to Madison for a lecture. But it's especially gratifying when one comes at the invitation of one of the McArdle Lab's sister departments and when the reason, the occasion, is for the most distinguished lectureship in the natural sciences, the Harry Steenbach Lectureship. In terms of recognition for an outstanding career in research, Ginter Global is undoubtedly the most outstanding person <coughs> coming out of the McArdle Laboratory in terms of the recognition that he has received here in the United States. And his record is in the leaflet that's already in your hands, and I shall not list all of the honors that he has received there in print. He came to me with an MD in 1962, and worked toward a PhD the hard way with much required coursework. What the record doesn't show is the story of Ginter's flight from the eastern part of Germany as the Russian army approached in 1945. They left their home, his mother and her four other children and Gunther left their home and found shelter with relatives somewhat west of Dresden. They witnessed the fire and smoke as that city was totally destroyed by a live aerial bombardment. Ginter has been married for 20 years to the same lovely lady named Laura, and he has used some of his prize money to initiate the landscaping at the entrance to the McGarden building and to help with the restoration of Dresden's famous church. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Ginter Wolf. Well, thank you very much, Len, for this uh, lovely introduction. It's a, it was a very great pleasure being back in Madison to see so many old friends. And so it brings alive many memories, uh, many sweats. The Cleveland exam, the job was failed. Dan saved me from failing at the last minute. And other very pleasant memories, swimming in the lake at this point when I arrived in 1962, you could still see the bottom of the lake. <laughs> A little bit later, all of this wheat started growing, and the wheat harvest just came along. And uh, so um, I thought I would. Uh, what happened to my screen? Suddenly off. Um, I would like to show you a ah, just touching it. Uh, I would just like to show you a picture of, of Van, how he looked in those days. Um, Uh, yeah. Okay, reverse. 
So now I go down and I put it in. So this is Van sitting at his desk. At this, at this moment in his life, he was very interested in Frank Lloyd Wright uh, in the Monona Terrace. And as I hear the Monona Terrace finally is being built, the <laughs> man in those days, in the early 60s, was very much interested in uh, having the Mon Monona Terrace uh, uh, constructed. And um, uh, his, his efforts uh, really kind of have now come to fruition. And it's very, very nice and lovely to see. He also then became interested in diurnal variations. And uh, you see him here is uh, involved with all of his papers. And we used to go into his office to announce uh, our new findings. And he would have discussions with us on this. Now, uh, Van mentioned uh, Dresden. And uh, I just thought I would show you a slide of that. Um, uh, let me see whether I can see it. This is the skyline of, of this city which was uh, considered one of the most beautiful skylines in Europe. And you can see all of these Rococo and Baroque towers. And the, the most uh, famous of these is, let me see this, is the, the Frauenkirche, this one. And uh, uh, all of this has been reconstructed except for this one. And I have uh, founded a foundation called Friends of Dresden uh, to collect $10 million. And we have so far $1 million, which is not bad. Um, uh, to help in the reconstruction of this church. I also show you uh, the church in its full glory here. The, the particular nice aspect is, uh, is its uh, cupola, which is not just a semi-sphere, but is in form of a bell. This is over 100 meters high, so it's a very large building. And the cupola is in form of a bell. You can see here it's a bell-shaped thing. And this was very unique. It is really the only bell-like cupola, and it's also called the famous stone bell. And it is going to be reconstructed exactly as it was. And uh, so if anybody of you is interested uh, in helping out, I'm available for contact. <laughs> so now uh, I don't want to talk only about the uh, my previous life here and what I do besides science. Incidentally, this reminds me a little bit on uh, the nucleus. Tomorrow you will see nuclear pores in these little windows. <laughs> <laughs> like nuclear pore anyway, um, so what I would like to talk about in these two lectures, today and tomorrow, is uh, shown in this high resolution electron microgravity cell. <laughs> and uh, what you see here are some of the principal organelles. You see here the nuclear envelope, the double membrane, and you have these 100 nanometer pores, uh, which are filled with a pore complex. And we know that uh, traffic in and out of the nucleus is bidirectional. Proteins go in, but proteins come also out. Um, peas go in, um, peas come out. Uh, DNPs like viruses, adenoviruses, for instance, also go in to the nucleus um, uh, via, uh, via the nuclear core complex. So this is a really a bidirectional, very large transport organelle, and I will talk about this tomorrow. The other uh, major transport system which I started out uh, to work with is, is uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. Incidentally, I was just reflecting uh, on, uh, on, on the last 30 years of, of my career. And uh, actually, everything I've done is I've started here at, 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 in Van Potter's lab. We started to work on the nucleus, and we developed a procedure which isolated uh, nuclear van, you may remember. Uh, you wrote the paper, actually. And um, uh, it was a very nice procedure to isolate rapid and nuclear and high yield. It was published in Science. And I uh, continued to work on the nucleus. And then also worked on membrane-bound ribosomes in the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, from the membrane-bound ribosomes, we then went to the signal hypothesis and to all of these other things, which I will tell you about in the lecture today. So basically, I have continued uh, uh, the work that I have started in Van's lab over the last 30 years. And uh, as you can see, I'm far, far from being finished with this work. And it's still an unfinished symphony to a very long extent. I shouldn't even say symphony. It's a minor uh, quartet, I would say. But in any case, um, so the other uh, major systems are, of course, you, I don't want to go into detail, are mitochondria, where you have translocation across outer membrane, across post membranes, and you also have proteins translocated from the matrix into the intermembrane space or integrated into the membrane. So there are three distinct translocation systems in mitochondria, three distinct ones in chloroplasts. I will briefly talk about one of them at the end 
simply because it is so different from the one in the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what all of these translocation systems have in common, those which are unidirectional and those which are bidirectional, is that they all have the, the information for this process is encoded in the protein itself, in what we have called a signal sequence. And that signal sequence is then recognized by a couple of soluble factors which targets the protein to these membranes. <coughs> and then uh, you open up a protein conducting channel which allows passage of the protein across the membrane. Or in the case of membrane proteins, uh, which also have a signal sequence and also need to be targeted, you have an additional, uh, what we call topogenic sequence, which helps in integrating the protein into the membrane, which we have called stop transfer sequence. So what I will talk about today is primarily how proteins get across the endoplasmic reticulum, and also a little bit about this system because it's interesting. Uh, now, uh, again, uh, the, the story of this goes back a long time, uh, and, and that it started in 1975, and we were able to set up a cell-free translation system. And that cell-free system really, I can see that I can try it with the lights on, because it may be, no, so I have to go back to this and keep you in the dark. Um, so, and, and this cell-free system faithfully reproduced uh, a, a translocation of secretory proteins into the endoplasmic reticulum. That is, we were able to take a secretory protein translated in a cell-free protein synthesis system at microsomal membranes, and we got the chains translocated across the membranes. And that was really a key uh, to set up this uh, cell-free system, because then it allowed to, to look at protein translocation from the biochemical point of view. Once you had it in the in vitro system, you could take a party in vitro system, and you could study um, the various aspects of it. And so what it, 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 I'm not going to go and summarize uh, and tell you the entire history of this, but um, the first thing which we isolated was this so-called signal recognition particle, which is indicated here. And what the signal recognition particle does, surprisingly, is an RNA-containing particle, which contains seven sRNA and six polypeptide chains. This particle interacts with the ribosome and recognizes signal sequences which emerge from uh, some sort of space in the ribosome subunit, and then um, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a process of recognition by the cytoplasmic signal recognition factor. And then what happens next is, is uh, that the signal recognition particle, the SRP, then is recognized by a signal recognition particle receptor, SRP receptor in the membrane. Maybe I can focus this a little bit. Let me see what I can do with this, because it seems to be all out of focus. I cannot do it, so let me see this is focusing. Focus is always oh, made it on. Oh, right. Okay. It's pretty bad to look at this. Oh, this is a little bit better. Okay, so um, this SRP then binds to an SRP receptor. And uh, there is a number of reactions which have been largely figured out in Peter Walter's lab in San Francisco and Reed Gilmore's lab, both of them worked in my laboratory previously. And what they have shown is that the SRP uh, has uh, one of the six proteins of the SRP uh, of 54 kilodalton is a GTPase and also binds uh, the signal sequence. And the alpha and the beta subunits are also GTPases. So there are three GTPases involved in this targeting uh, process. And uh, I, I won't go and explain you uh, precisely what happens here, because many of the details aren't known yet. I just want you to keep in mind that there are three GTPases involved in that. And somehow then the signal sequence is released from SRP, and then uh, it, it interacts with what we had postulated to be a protein conducting channel, binds to uh, the protein conducting channel, and together with the binding of the ribosome and the signal sequence opens this channel, and the chain is then translocated across the membrane. Now, the uh, protein conducting channel has been one of the most controversial aspects of what we had called the signal hypothesis. And it received vigorous opposition because it was thought that the hydrophobic signal peptide would just partition into the bilayer and that from the free energy which you get from this partitioning, it would be enough to get the chain across the membrane. This was proposed by 
starts in Engelmann in 1980. And of course, we had proposed this channel in 1975, and we're never able to get any evidence. And as time went on, I was going around and talking about channels and hand waving. Finally, an electrophysiologist came to me and said, why don't you send me some membranes, and we will do some patch clamping, and then we should see whether there is a channel. And so, uh, a couple of months later, hesitantly, I called up because I hadn't heard from this person. And have you found this channel? No, I haven't found this channel. So it was very depressing news. Really, so we were, um, I, I sort of uh, <coughs> had almost given up on the idea that there must be a channel. But uh, intuitively, it sounded, it sounded perfectly fine because you have channels for ions. And, and the polypeptide chain, after all, is an, uh, is an ion, a poly ion. So it's unlikely that the polypeptide chain with charged residues would just reverse a little bit by there. But of course, you know, there are models which have been suggested, like this one, uh, by Schatz, for instance, <coughs> that, uh, that uh, uh, by a chain here indicated with uh, positively charged residues in the case of mitochondria could just interact with a rearranged lipid bilayer, like this where you have sort of a hexagonal phase transition and that the chain then could go across the membrane. So this was proposed in 1986, for instance, by Schatz. So the idea of a protein conducting channel was in fact not accepted. And uh, it, was a very, uh, it was a very controversial idea. In fact, I had one of my grant proposals turned down for dogmatic adherence to outmoded ideas. <laughs> and so uh, it was, of course, very difficult to persuade uh, 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 Sandy Simon, who was an electrophysiologist and who joined my lab specifically not to work in electrophysiology, but to do cell biology, uh, to persuade him to look for this channel. And so <clears throat> what we did, essentially, we went back to a very uh, old method. We uh, Just let me show you here the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, uh, which uh, uh, you see the membrane started with ribosomes and when you homogenize the, uh, the cell and the endoplasmic reticulum then breaks up into little uh, so-called microsomal vesicles. The, uh, the vesicles are sealing spontaneously and you get these microsomal vesicles with the ribosomes on the outside and each of these vesicles contains about a hundred or so ribosomes, right? So, uh, so we went to the very uh, old technique of Müller and Rudin, which have been published some time ago, um, uh, using a planar bilayer system. And um, the setup is as follows. You have two chambers. Sorry, I, I don't want to frighten people off who are not electrophysiologists, because I didn't know anything about electrophysiology until I met Sandy Simon, and he taught me a bit about it. But, and I still don't know much about it. In any case, what this system uses is a chamber, um, uh, about three milliliter of uh, liquids on both sides, and this is uh, a plastic division between these two chambers, and then you have a little hole in this plastic division, and you can paint a planar bilayer on this hole. So this uh, is a planar bilayer on this, uh, in this little hole here, and, and if you have a voltage clamp, and you measure current, you don't measure any current going through the lipid bilayer because the lipid bilayer cannot conduct any ions. But the minute you put a channel in this bilayer, then of course you get ion conductance which you can measure by current flow. And so, um, let me see whether I can focus this a little bit. They seem to be all out of focus here. Uh, now, so when you add rough microsomes with the ribosomes here in red, uh, to, these, uh, to this chamber, to, let's call it the cis chamber, and you do it with an osmotic gradient, you occasionally, rarely, but occasionally, do get fusion of a vesicle with this planar bilayer. And so when this happens, you see occasionally a few channels uh, of 100 picosiemens channels, which are <coughs> usually larger than iron channels. But that's all we saw, and that was very disappointing because we, accept that we expected that we would see maybe a hundred channels. Each ribosome sitting on a channel, we thought we would see maybe a hundred channels, and we would see big conductances. But in fact, we saw only one channel or two, and of course we wouldn't know what channels are they. Are they protein conducting channels? Are they channels to get ATP across? Sugar nucleotides which have to be transported? Are they channels for those processes, or what are they? So then, uh, of course, the main, uh, the, the, the good thing was that we saw channels. So we knew that we had some fusion. But the bad thing is that we didn't see what we wanted to see, namely a hundred or so channels. And so then we decided, why is it that we don't see the channel? 
Could it be that the polypeptide chain which sits in the channel will not allow conductance of ions? So while these ribosomes conduct a chain across the membrane here, it cannot conduct simultaneously ions, at least not large quantities that we can detect. And that's what you actually would suspect, because you know that the lumen of the ER, for instance, has millimolar concentrations of calcium, and, uh, and, and, and the cytoplasm has only sub-nanomolar concentrations. So uh, the lumen of the R has segregated within uh, 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 different ions. And if you would have a leak, particularly a large protein conducting channel, you would eliminate this gradient of calcium, for instance. So one would imagine that while the chain is going across the channel, there is not at the same time co-conductance of a large number of ions. So when the chain sits in the channel, we will not see any conductance of ions. In other words, this channel is electrophysiologically silent, cannot be detected. And of course, if the, if the ribosome comes off and the chain is, is, has been translocated, one could imagine that the channel closes immediately, again, for the physiological reason that you do not want to have active liberation of calcium across this membrane. So this is, we figured, may have been the reason why this electrophysiologist who tried patch clamping didn't see anything, because the channel is either closed, or when the chain sits in the channel, it doesn't conduct ions. So then we thought, how could we trick the system that it would conduct ions? And so one possibility is to kick out the nasal channel and keep the ribosome still attached to the membrane. And a few years earlier, with David Sabatini, we had worked out a procedure where you can precisely do that. At low salt, 50 millimolar salt, for instance, you can add pure mycin, and the pure mycin will then uh, uh, release the chain from, uh, from the ribosome and will get it across the membrane. For instance, if you give pure mycin to tissue culture cells, these peptidyl pure mycins actually are secreted. Now, many of the new graduate students here probably don't know what pure mycin is anymore. When I grew up, we all threw in pure mycin and actinomycin in our experiments. Nowadays, it's grafell and it's something else. Uh, but uh, let me quickly show you what the structure of pure mycin looks like. It's really an analog of uh, amino acid tRNA with the nucleoside moiety here and the amino acid here. And so in the tRNA, of course, you have a, a large number of nucleotides which hold onto the ribosome. In pure mycin, you do not have that. So uh, this reacts with the carboxyl terminal of the nascent chain, and the peptidyl transferase of the ribosome couples this amino terminal of this of this amino acid moiety here to the carboxyl terminal of the nascent chain. And since you have nothing to hold on, the, the peptidyl pure mycin just slips out of the ribosome, slips across the membrane, and is actually secreted. So when we gave the peptidyl pure mycin to the, to, sorry, to, the, to the cis side of the membrane, so we gave the pure mycin to this side of the chamber, and the pure mycin needs the ribosome to couple uh, it to the nascent chain. Uh, if you give the pure mycin to this side, nothing will happen. The pure mycin cannot cross the membrane, and therefore it will have no accessibility to the ribosome, and therefore nothing should happen. So we added the pure mycin to this side, and lo and behold, what we, uh, sorry, I'm going uh, backward here, I have to go forward again. Lo and behold, we saw a huge increase in conductance. We see the pure mycin is added. This is now on the minute scale. And we see a huge increase in conductance. This is nano sequence. And uh, so since this was all done in low salt, these channels remain open. And uh, the ribosome is still attached to the membrane. And this is, of course, an unphysiological situation. Normally, when the nascent chain is released from the ribosome, the ribosome probably comes off the membrane, and the channel is closed. But in this way, we have tricked the whole system, and the channel remained open, and we get this huge increase in conductance. Now, the next uh, uh, experiment, of course, uh, when, when this uh, Sandy Simon presented this data in the lab meeting, some of his competitors immediately said, well, this is an artifact, because you know, it's clear that pure mycin is only 95% pure, and there are all sorts of other ionophores in there, and all what you have done is you have added a bunch of ionophores, and now you see a huge increase in conductance. But you remember that we have this very nice control that we can add the pure mycin to the trans side, and then it shouldn't do anything. And in fact, this is what Sandy did. When he added it to the trans chamber, where the ribosomes are not exposed, you see, you see nothing. 
When then you add the pyromycin to the cis chamber at this point, you see again this huge increase in conductance. In this case, we got up to 60 nanosiemens. So this was uh, at least the sightedness of the membrane could be used as a very powerful argument that what we are observing is the true uh, effect. The pyromycin really cleared out the channels and therefore these channels, which normally are not designed to conduct ions, but they are designed to conduct uh, 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 the polypeptide chains, now are able to conduct uh, ions under voltage clamp conditions. And uh, uh, actually the conductance, for those of you who are interested in electrophysiology, is 62 million ions per second. Ion channels usually have a, two, a couple million ions per second, so it's a huge, a huge channel. Um, uh, of course, we cannot estimate from these sort of data the diameter of the channel, but if you assume that a chain uh, is, is going through the channel in a, in a loop configuration, and it must accommodate a, a, a two a, a parallel, anti parallel loop, it, it could be as, as, as large as 20 angstrom in diameter. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so then the next thing which Sandy did is to add pyromycin at very low concentration. So that perhaps we would clear one channel after the other, and we could see individual channels. And so, uh, and that was really uh, very nice. You can see uh, he added pyromycin in, in sub-micromolar concentrations, and uh, you can see now that, if, that nothing happens for a while, and then one channel uh, is cleared, and we see a jump of 220 pic 220 picosiemens at this point. So one channel has been cleared. This channel stays open and then nothing happens for a while, and then two channels are cleared. Actually, if you do this in seconds, you can see a, a nice discrete, is a distinct step in between. And then a fourth channel was opened, and so on. And we have now uh, recordings where we can go on, you know, for a very long time. The, the uh, limitation in these experiments is that very often your membranes break, and then your experiment comes to an, an end. It's a technically very demanding procedure, so it is, is a procedure which takes a tremendous amount of patience. But anyway, so these distinct steps then indicated to us that in fact uh, each of these protein conducting channels has distinct conductance properties and that it can conduct uh, up to 220 uh, picosiemens worth of ions. Okay, so then um, um, this is all I'm going to tell you about, about uh, this channel. And um, uh, there is another question which I briefly want to discuss with you. I will come back to the channel a little bit later on because it has been isolated uh, primarily by genetic approaches, uh, uh, primarily in Randy Shackman's lab. I will come back to this. But I would, before I go into uh, what the channel looks like, sh uh, raise another problem with you. And that is how do membrane proteins get in? And what we postulated some time ago, that membrane proteins, of course, do have signal sequences as well. And we showed uh, this in the case of the uh, BS, uh, uh, protein of a virus, uh, the deciduous stomatitis virus glycoprotein, which is a transmembrane protein with an amino terminal on the trans side and a carboxyl terminal on the cis side. And we showed that, in fact, it does have a signal sequence, and we showed that this signal sequence competes with secretory proteins for translocation across the membrane. So the signal sequence of a membrane protein, of a secretory protein, are addressed to the same translocation system in the ER. And so that what happens then, we postulate, also we don't have any evidence at this moment, is that another sequence, which is hydrophobic in nature, is able to open the channel laterally to the lipid bilayer. So that this so-called stop transfer sequence can be displaced from the channel and chain translocation uh, subsides and the carboxyl terminal of the chain remains in the cytoplasm and of course the channel closes. And what we also postulated is for membrane proteins which span the membranes many times that you can repeat this maneuver, you can open the channel again and you can integrate the next segment of the channel. So uh, that there is other uh, models of how you can uh, imagine this. It may be that you can actually integrate more than one loop into the channel by recruiting more members of the channel proteins or by perhaps recruiting heat shock proteins which sit in the membrane as integral membrane proteins. I don't want to go into this because it's all speculation and there is a very little data on this, but I just want to keep you aware that membrane proteins use the same mechanism of a signal sequence, but then somehow they escape a segment which passes through the channel, escapes from the channel. 
So this protein conducting channel is more than just a passive conduit for polypeptide chains. It is really a proofreading device, not a proofreading device. It's something which recognizes features of the nascent chain and can therefore do an opening and closing in two dimensions. Ion channels don't do that. They open and close in one dimension. So the protein conducting channel is different from ion channels in a way in that it can open and close in both dimensions. Okay, so now uh, I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, and unfortunately you won't see anything here. Uh, this is um, a briefly summarizing what this channel looks like. There's much uh, prettier pictures which have recently been published by, by Chris Akey and Chris Miller and Tom Rappaport who have um, isolated uh, the, the, the channel complex. Now, the, just very briefly, the history, uh, the proteins of the channel complex, sec 61 in particular, was first uh, described in Randy Shackman's lab by genetic means. And then uh, Peter Walter uh, added two more components to the system, namely uh, sex 71 and sec 72. So the, the components of the channels is uh, sec 61, alpha, beta, gamma, uh, 62, and 63. We are identified in Randy Schachmann's lab 71 and 72 uh, in Peter Walter's lab in yeast. And Tom Rappaport has identified the components in the mammalian system. And uh, these proteins, uh, in this case, have been isolated in <coughs> our lab here by Ronald Beckman using a tag, a staff A tag, on sec 62, which can be cleaved off with a factor 10 site. And you can, in one step, purify in Kormasi stain quantity this channel. And you can put it on a grid, <coughs> and you very see these donut-like uh, structures, which are not as well uh, uh, visible here as the one which you have recently seen in a paper by Chris Aki, Chris Miller, and Tom Rappaport in Cell. Uh, of course, you know, if you look at negative staining, you can see very often uh, a stain depositing in these, uh, uh, you know, central cavities or whatever. Large proteins. Uh, uh, may have a dimple where negative stain deposits. That doesn't mean necessarily that this is a channel. So what we have to do is we really have to have three-dimensional reconstruction of the channel. And what Roland Beckman is now doing is binding this complex to the ribosome and then is doing, three dim is, is doing vitreous ice electron microscopy in three-dimensional reconstruction of the channel. And that should really give us an idea whether we are really looking here at a channel. Uh, but anyway, and then of course, uh, very much like in the ion channel work, we have to figure out uh, uh, what, uh, what is the signal sequence binding site, what are the riding si by ribosome binding sites, how is the channel gated open across the bilayer, how is the channel open to the bilayer, and so on. So there is a huge amount of structural work and biophysical work which has to be done in order to understand how this protein conducting channel works. And I don't want to go into a very great detail. Uh, now, um, let me quickly summarize a bit of work that we have done in E. coli. And uh, the E. coli translocation channel uh, in the plasma membrane can be, uh, uh, probably has arisen in evolution by invagination of the coli membrane, to f of the coli plasma membrane to form the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, uh, the proteins um, which form this channel, namely the so-called SEC-Y, E and G proteins, were the first channel proteins that were discovered in John Beckfuss's lab uh, by Thompson Harvey and also by a group in Japan. So they were really the first channel proteins which were uh, discovered, SEC-Y, E and G. Of course, it wasn't known at this point that they were channel proteins. It was just known that temperature-sensitive mutants in these proteins inhibit translocation across the bacterial plasma membrane. And so in evolution, you can think about the plasma membrane having invaginated and then formed the endoplasmic reticulum, so that that channel which translocates uh, proteins across the bacterial plasma membrane is perhaps fairly similar to the channel in the ER. In fact, the signal sequence which opens this channel in bacteria 
is very similar to signal sequences of secretory proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum. And so this allows essentially to express insulin or pre-pro-insulin in bacteria and get secretion of pre-pro-insulin across the plasma membrane. And this is important for genetic engineering and for, uh, for recombinant production of this protein. And uh, the signal peptidase of E. coli uh, will then cleave the signal peptide at the correct side and you get secretion of pro-insulin into the periplasmic space. But anyway, uh, so we, we were looking at uh, whether we can detect a channel also here in the prokaryotic plasma membrane. So uh, you can break up the bacterium um, uh, into vesicles, either uh, uh, inside out vesicles where a signal peptide binding site which faces usually the cytoplasm would now be exposed to the outside of the vesicle and you can also have right side uh, uh, out vesicle, right side vesicle where, the, um, where, the, uh, 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 where this side is on the outside. But we made inverted vesicles and then we, we again used the planar bilayer trick to uh, um, um, fuse it to the uh, 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 to the lipid bilayer in these two chamber systems. So this is the chambers again, the trans chamber, the cis chamber. We added the vesicle. So if you add the vesicle, the inverted vesicle, the signal peptide binding site should now be exposed to the cis side and not to the trans side. So what we then did is we made, synth we made uh, a synthetic signal peptide. We have postulated in 1975 that the signal peptide will function in gating the channel open. So very much, uh, it is, would very much be like a ligand gated channel. As you know, the acetylcholine receptor is, for instance, an example of a ligand gated channel where acetylcholine, the ligand, opens the channel. And here we postulated that the signal peptide may have that function and may open the channel. So we synthesized a signal peptide by chemical means, by the Marifat muscle, and we added it to this cis chamber in the hope that it would open the channel. Now when we did this, <coughs> uh, we got a tremendously noisy record because we did it in physiological salt concentration. And what happens in physiological salt concentration, the signal peptide binds and then the channel <coughs> opens, but it comes off again and it closes. So we got a tremendously noisy record which was very disappointing. It was almost, uh, we struggled with it and we didn't know what to do with it. And then by accident, Sandy Simon, one day, added the signal peptide of high salt, a 500 millimolar salt. Now remember, the signal peptide is hydrophobic. So in high salt, you reinforce hydrophobic interactions. So in high salt, the signal peptide will remain bound to the signal peptide binding side of this channel. And now the channel is full. It, it thinks there is something coming along. Nothing is actually coming other than the signal peptide, and it opens. And that you will see in the next recording, which I show you. Uh, when you add, sorry, I'm going backward again, forward. Uh, when you open it, when you add the signal peptide, you can see these very nice increases again in conductance. And this is done in high salt. In each of these conductance step, at 50 millimolar salt, and you recalculate this for 50 millimolar salt, all of it was done in 500 millimolar. But when you, put, uh, when you calculate for 50 millimolar salt, it's 220 picosiemens. So it is the same conductance properties that we get with the signal peptide in opening the channel in the plasma membrane of E. coli then we, that we get when we purge, when we clear the protein conducting channel of the endoplasmic reticulum by pyromycin. So the conductance properties of both channels are the same. And of course, you know, I mentioned to you, you add high salt, the signal peptide remains bound to the channel, and so the channels don't close. They always remain open for conducting these ions. And of course, if you lower the salt concentration, they all close, because uh, they, they come at uh, the signal. They, or we get the noisy record again. We get the very noisy record. So it's very clear then that the signal peptide can be a ligand, whether it is the only ligand for opening the channel. Of course, it's another question. In the case of co-translational translocation, in the case of the ER, it is very clear that the ribosome plays, uh, plays some role in, 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 in keeping at least the channel in a, in, a, in a stabilized configuration. Whether it actually plays a role in opening the channel is another question and remains to be addressed. Now, of course, since we have 
SEC61, we can now reconstitute these putative channel proteins and can see whether we get the same conductance properties that we have observed with the native membranes. And uh, so far we haven't uh, been successful in doing so, but it may be because uh, we need, besides SEC61, we need other proteins to do this sort of thing, for instance, BIP or other proteins. So we have so far not been able to use this approach with reconstituted proteoliposomes to get these sort of recordings. But we, we think that this, the reason for that is because we don't have all the components that are present in the native memory. Okay, so this is, uh, 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 okay, this is just another control. If you add the signal peptide to the periplasmic side, uh, you don't get anything, and then if you add it to the cytosolic side, you get, again, here's two steps, one step, another step, opening of these, of these channels. So this is the control, that this is really a site-specific phenomenon. Uh, now, uh, so in summary, then, uh, what, we, what we know is that, uh, and I, I have three more slides, which I will talk about the flow, but in summary of this work, so the signal peptide uh, at high salt can bind to these protein phenomenon channels, and can then open a channel. And here's the corresponding uh, recording uh, of it. You can see uh, one single step increase in conductance. And now if you go and clear the chain by pure mycin, uh, uh, you can see again this increase in conductance. So we have cleared out one channel. And now if we remove the ribosome, we increase the salt concentration. Uh, uh, we can remove the ribosome and then the channel closes. And you can see the record here and you can see here. So this, of course, in summary, of course, is, is a very highly unphysiological uh, maneuvers that we had to use to reveal this protein from that channel. And this is the reason why it was so difficult to demonstrate. And this is why it was so much fun uh, to, to chase it, because it was really uh, 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 sort of a, uh, a totally <coughs> unknown territory. Nobody had try to do electrophysiology on a protein conducting channel. And it is also clear why our friends who tried patch clamping didn't go anywhere with it because you know these channels are either closed or when they have uh, when they are in the process of, of conducting a chain, they don't conduct ions and they are electrically silent. And it was a great deal of fun to actually do these experiments and to learn something about electrophysiology. Now in the last couple of minutes I just wanted to demonstrate to you that that nature has invented this protein conducting channel many times over. One would imagine that it, 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 once it has invented it, once it would use it for all the other systems, mitochondria, chloroplast, for oxisomes, and so on. But uh, the great surprise was that when we looked at the chloroplast outer membrane, that uh, in fact uh, the channel there looks completely different and works by a completely different principle. Whereas this uh, ER channel, SEC61, is a highly hydrophobic protein, which probably has some uh, amphiphilic helices, which then, because we know from Tom Rappaport's work and from uh, Chris Ecke's work, that the SEC61 forms a tetramer or pentamer, and there must be some uh, amphiphilic helices which line the, uh, the, uh, uh, the aqueous core of this channel. In the case of the chloroplast, it appears that the channel is made up of a molecule which looks very much like a pore. So it is not hydrophobic at all. In fact, it doesn't have a single hydrophobic alpha helix spanning the membrane. It all appears to be better through the sheets. And if you take any one of the paradigms which have been proposed in the literature, it's something like each protein has something like 26 uh, better pleated sheets crossing the membrane. Now let me show you how we got the uh, uh, channel in the in the bacteria in the in the chloroplast uh, uh, membrane, and I think this is work of Danny Schnell in our lab and Felix Kassler. And I, I, this is again, I think, very nice work because um, it's a very nice method of pulling out the channel. So what they did is here's the outer chloroplast membrane. And I'm already summarizing what they found. There are. Uh, uh, so-called YAPs, which means uh, translocation intermediate associated proteins, actually a terrible name, but uh, whatever, uh, and these are the molecular weight, so there's YAP 86, YAP 34, uh, YAP 75, and uh, there's also a heat shock protein, a unique heat shock protein, which is associated with this channel. 
And so what, they, what Danny Schnell and, and, and Felix Kessel did is they took a precursor which had a signal sequence associated with it. And as you know, in chloroplasts there have to be two signal sequences. One which opens the channel in the outer membrane and another one which opens the channel in the inner membrane. So what they did is they did uh, uh, they took this uh, precursor which was expressed in E. coli and then added urea uh, to it to unfold it and then diluted out the urea, uh, ex uh, the urea uh, precursor into chloroplast, added ATP and GTP, and lo and behold, you get import uh, into the chloroplast. But if you do a time course, you get the import in stages. You first engage the channel in the outer membrane and then you engage the channel in the inner membrane. And what Danny Schnell used, they put at the carboxyl terminal of this precursor protein a staph A protein. So that the staph A protein uh, presumably would be folded and would not allow the complete transfer of the protein into the lumen, uh, into the stroma of the chloroplast and would eventually, yes, because they're heat shock proteins and so on and so on, but it would slow it down a bit. And so we were hoping that we would end up with a stuck translocation intermediate, which would then, after detergent solubilization, using the staph A protein tag, which sits out here, be able to pull out not only this stuck translocation intermediate, but with it, the channel proteins. And lo and behold, this worked, uh, at least for the outer membrane uh, 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 components of the channel. And uh, I show you this uh, very briefly here. This is incidentally a very nice electron micrograph where, uh, again, I'm trying to focus this a little bit. It's better perhaps. Where we took the chloroplast, put it on a grid, stained it very lightly, and then used IgG gold particles to label the staph A moiety which hangs out into the cytoplasm. And you can see that the gold particles do not label the surface of the chloroplast randomly, but label them in these sort of ridges. And it had been earlier shown uh, by Staling in Colorado a long time ago that freeze fraction of the chloroplast gives you ridges of particles in the outer chloroplast and inner chloroplast membranes. So what we think is that these distribution of non-random distributions of these uh, translocation <coughs> intermediates on the surface of the chloroplast represent the non-random distribution of these protein conducting channels in the chloroplast uh, membrane. And so uh, I think this is all, or maybe I have one more slide. Uh, no, here's a, the, actually the data slide for that. Uh, so if we, if we, and this is my last slide, if you um, do the incubation with these precursors for a very short time and then pull out, uh, these are the total chloroplast membrane proteins, you see that you pull out a subset of proteins, this one, this one, and this one. This is the precursor here and a bit of the process form of the precursor uh, that we used. And this is done in silver stain, and you can see that you pull out nearly stoichiometric amounts of this. This band actually turned out to be two bands uh, because there is a bit of HSP7 like protein buried in this. Now, if you do the incubation a bit longer for 2.5 minutes, you also <coughs> engage the channel in the inner membrane and you pull out two more proteins this one and uh, this one in addition. Uh, now, we have cloned and sequenced all of these proteins. Uh, these three pro four proteins, actually only, actually only three, we haven't beat, three we haven't done the HSP70 type because it presented some difficulties. Uh, and what we found is that the, uh, I'm, I'm really going back here to the slide to explain you in summary what, uh, what we really found. Um, sorry, uh, and this is the end of my talk. And, uh, that uh, these two proteins, YAP86 and YAP34, are two GTPases. <coughs> So it's very much like in the case of the endoplasmic reticulum that you have GTPases which sit in the membrane. And we assume that there is, under physiological conditions, some signal recognition factor uh, which recognizes the uh, signal sequence here and then targets this entire complex to these uh, GTP binding proteins, YAP86 and YAP34, very much like in the case of the ER where you have the SOP receptor alpha and beta subunits. And so then you have this uh, 70, YAP75, 
which I told you looks like a poor, uh, uh, like a porin. It has not a single alpha uh, a helix spanning the membrane, but has only these better field sheets. And then there is, in substoichiometric amounts, also associated with this complex, this HSP70-like protein, which uh, may play a role in preventing backward fluctuation of, of this uh, protein uh, across the membrane, and then may help in the transportation process. So in summary then, and let me turn on the light again here. Um, in summary then, uh, I've told you a little bit about protein translocation across the protein conducting channels in the ER. And uh, we have now isolated in the case of the ER, a, 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 or, or a, a candidate uh, for, the, for the protein conducting channels in the ER have been Defined and so also they have been defined uh, in the in the case of the chloroplast outer membrane. Uh, these are so far the only membranes for which channel candidates have been identified. In mitochondria, they have not yet been identified, and neither have they been identified in peroxisomes. Neither have they been identified uh, in the uh, thylakoid membranes, and so on and so on. So we have a long way to uh, go to understand how these channels work, and uh, this work is now past the inventory stage, the inventory stage is over in this field and is now going to move into biophysics and into structural biology. And so this will be the, the next challenge is to understand how on a biophysical level and on a structural level these uh, channels work and how they do their work. Incidentally, in the ER you have about in the average cell about um, one million channels, uh, protein conducting channels, and in the chloroplast we have estimated you have about 3,000 protein conducting channels in the outer membrane. Tomorrow I will talk about uh, the channel which constitutes the nuclear pore complex or which is in the center of the nuclear pore complex. And that channel has a diameter 10 times larger than the channel in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is estimated to be 20 angstrom in diameter. And the uh, channel in the central channel in the nuclear pore complex has a diameter of 250 uh, uh, angstrom. So in this case of translocation across the, the unidirectional translocation systems, uh, you need to have the protein unfolded. Uh, protein translocation can occur only in unfolded, unfolded configuration. And so you have heat shock proteins helping you to keep the protein in unfolded configuration. In the case of transport across the nuclear core complex, uh, because uh, the channel is 250 angstrom in diameter, uh, heat shock proteins do not play a major role. And uh, uh, translocation uh, is not uh, occurring on folded uh, substrates. But I will talk about this uh, much more tomorrow. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I will be happy to so obviously you can open the channel by knocking out the NAS and peptide sequence with bromycin on the other hand, presumably the ribosome is still bound, so it does not occlude the pore. On the other hand, you can open the channel by adding the signal peptide, which may bind to a certain receptor site and uh, not occlude the pore. So do you know what occludes the pore? Is it the additional sequence in the NAS and peptide? Yeah, the question was whether uh, when you add the signal peptide uh, and you keep the channel in an open configuration at high sound, and uh, nothing else follows it, what would occlude it? Would the nation chain occlude it? The answer is that's what you think. Also, we haven't done the experiment. Do you have further comment? Hmm? Yes? Okay. Well, the the experiment hasn't been done. Peter, how do this repeat how do these channels compare with the channels which are formed by something so diverse as polysins on one hand, on the other hand, the crystal protein of the Bacillus tunisiensis, which seems to be a very nice uh, strategy to put a hole and kill the cell in this way, so they would spill all the liquid. 
Yeah, <laughs> nothing has changed, Russell. He sits what always in the first. No, no. He always Sorry. sits in the first row and he asks very precise questions. <laughs> he speaks very loudly, so that you probably all have heard the question. <laughs> so, but I will repeat it nevertheless. So, you know, what is the difference between these protein conducting channels that I have just described and, let's say, something like colicin, uh, uh, or let's say, bacteria toxin, or ricin? which can form the channels. Now, I would call these private transport systems, taxis of biology, because the diphtheria toxin batters up and it forms a channel so that it can transport the alpha cell. And the same is true for some of the other systems like rice. So they are proteins which are designed to integrate itself, themselves, with into the bilayer, and they are private transport systems. Those are public transport systems where you have a channel which is designed to take a very large number, the whole spectrum of secretory proteins, which go from very highly charged to very small, to not so highly charged to highly charged and very large. And all what you need is a ticket, the signal sequence, which is a ligand to open this channel. So this channel is constructed to have, to provide access for a very large number of proteins to go across. Whereas the other channels are private, transport systems, taxis, which are designed you know, for, for, uh, for very few molecules. You can trick, actually, the diphtheria toxin. Uh, uh, it can conduct also, as far as I remember, the alpha subunit of ricin. If you make a disulfide bond between the beta subunit and ricin and the diphtheria toxin alpha subunit, you can trick them, too. And there are probably many other channel systems which I haven't described in bacteria which are very fascinating for phage exit, F1, for instance, have to, has to go through a channel in the outer membrane. And so there are many other channels uh, which we have to learn a great deal about. We know, we know about the proteins, but we don't know how they function in terms of structure, in terms of biophysics. Don't forget that not a single channel has been done by X-ray crystallography. And so we don't know anything about the structure of channels. This will be for the next generation to do. Hopefully, you will be able to do the X-ray crystallography, and we will have the 2.5 or 2 axon resolution of all of these channels, and then we will know exactly. I mean, we may know. We may have some idea. About <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Russell, you mentioned Biochemistry uh, graduate students will meet with Dr. Global tomorrow at uh, 12:30, and uh, that uh, the lecture uh, tomorrow is in the same place at the same time, 3:30, and we 